Father, we're grateful for another privilege that you've given unto us. And as we stand today before your great people, again, hide us beneath the cross. Cover us under your blood and let your word have free code. Meet the needs of every person that's in this room today. That the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Certainly we thank God for each of you that are here in the sanctuary. Thank God for those of you that are watching this service by television. It is our prayer that we share something that will meet the needs of you and that will bless you today, tomorrow, and next week, even in days, weeks, months, and even years to come. Having said that, let's go to the book of St. Mark, the ninth chapter, the 42nd through the 48th verses. St. Mark, chapter 9. 42 through 48. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he was cast into the sea. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life main than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where thy worm dies not, and the fires are not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life, you know, enter into life and having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Let me read that second verse. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off, it's better to enter, halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire, and never shall be quenched. Where that worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye and having two eyes to be cast into hell, where the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. Sin sends one to hell. That's what we talked about. Sin sends one to hell. In other words, uh, if you're in sin, you're not on your way to heaven. I don't believe in purgatory, so the only place, the other place is hell. So if you're not going to heaven, then you're on your way to hell. If you're not going up, I mean, it doesn't take a real smart person to figure that out. If you're not going up, then it's obvious you're going down. So sin, sin one to it. And I admit that we don't hear a lot of preaching against sin today. I'm convinced that many who are preaching are in sin themselves. If you live in a glass house, you ain't going to talk too tough, too tough. Not saying nothing. So, so sin is, is why Jesus came to the earth. Matthew 1 21. She shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Jesus. And he shall save his people from their sin. That's why he came. Now, if you are still in sin, I have a question to ask you. If you going to argue with me and tell me that you know you're saved though, but you're still in sin. I want to ask you a question. You don't have to ask me right now. Think about it and then ask me. If you are still in sin and you still say you're saved, 
then what are you saved from? So he came to save you from sin. That's why he came. Well, every, one man said, everybody sin. I sin, you sin, everybody sin. I said, well, when you say you sin, you're confessing. When you say you sin, you're judging. But when you say everybody sin, you're lying. Everybody not in sin. So let's deal with this today. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he was cast into the sea. Now, let me tell y'all something. A millstone is heavy. It's made out of iron or steel, and someone put a millstone around your neck and throw you into the, into the lake or into the sea. They're not looking to see you again. But that millstone will hold you at the bottom of the sea. In other words, you don't tell me you're shooting at a man's head and shooting to wound him. If you shoot him at his leg, you may, if you shoot him at his head, you're not trying to wound him. You're trying to kill him. I have that much sense. Someone shoot in my head. I, I was just trying to scare you. No, you weren't. You're trying to kill me. <laughs> Are y'all listening to me? So I'm saying, the Bible says, whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes that I'm talking to the church today. Because if folk don't believe in you, don't believe in your testimony, and yet you are trying to go forth in the name of the Lord. You are an offense to the word of God. Because your life is not lining up with the teaching of the word of God. You become an offense. So we need to make sure that if we say we're saved, that we're lining up with the teaching of this word. Because you don't have to say you're saved if you're not saved. There's no law against you saying you're not saved. There's no penalty on earth, brother. <laughs> they won't put you in jail for you saying you're not saved. Your job won't fire you if you tell me I'm not saved. Am I telling the truth? So you don't have to say you're saved. But if you say you are saved, your word and your life need to line up with the teaching of this word, because then your life becomes an offense. And it's better, the Bible said, that you put a millstone. Man, that's 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 kind of that's tough language there. <laughs> millstone. That's what they put on Emmett Till, a millstone. And he went down, and he stayed down. And they had to drag the lake to get him. Millstone. They hung it around his neck. 60 years ago, August 19 and 55, they put a millstone around Emmett Till's neck, a 15-year-old boy from Chicago, just because he whistled at a white woman. They put a millstone around his neck and dropped him in the ocean, in the, in the lake, rather. Jesus is saying here, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believes in me, it is better. I'm reading the Bible, y'all. I'm not trying to conjure up some. This is written in the Word. My Aunt Lena said, this is red writing. I mean, Jesus said that. It is better for him that a millstone was hung about his neck and he was cast into the sea. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. I'm going to deal with that in a few minutes. <laughs> it is better for thee to enter into life main and having two hands to go into hell. What good two hands going to do you in hell? You go to hell with five hands. What good are going to do you down there? It's a fire down there that never goes out. What good would two hands do you where fire is burning all the time and you won't burn up? That's constant. I think we need to preach about hell a little more. Because folk have got too comfortable in their sin. Okay. Having two hands to go into the fire which never shall be quenched. John F. Kennedy was buried in the year of 1963 at Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. I was there last year. 
they put what they call an eternal flame. They lit it when they buried him. It's still burning now. An eternal flame. But that's just a flame. Hell is worse than an inferno. Everywhere you look, it's burning. It's hell. It's designed for the unbelievers and the devils and his angels. Hell is not for the saints. But if you backslide, y'all not hear me. It says in the third verse, where that worm dies not. And the fire is not going. I'm going to deal with that in a few minutes, but I want to keep moving on this. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. <laughs> I heard one brother say, go to the hospital and have an amputated. He's not really saying that, but, you know, I hope nobody hear him. He was on radio saying that. Go to the hospital and have it amputated. You see, it's not a literal thing because I'm going to tell you something. There's a whole lot of one-legged folks still lusting. So it's not, it's not a literal cutting at all, but, but if, if, if it is a literal cutting at all, you'd still be better going to heaven limping than going to hell walking straight. And that's kind of the sense of it, you know. But I want to point out the point where that worm, keep that in mind, where well, worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot of in thee, cut it off. You would have done that. Uh, it's better to get a halt, better enter into life halt than having two feet into hell and to the fire that never shall be quenched. Where that worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, Ah, God, start off with your hand. Got your feet. <laughs> now you got your eyes. And if the eye offend thee, pluck it out. Cut the feet off, cut the hand off, but pluck the eye out. Woo! I know y'all don't like this guy preaching at all, do you? Y'all know why I'm preaching this sermon today? It's in the Bible. That's why I'm preaching. And it's in your Bible if you have one. And you need to take some time and read this because it's talking to you. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where thy worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. A thin little worm. One of the highest priorities for the believers is to set a holy example for their children by their life and teaching. This should be the highest priority of every parent, especially every believer, to set an example before your children by the life you live and by the teaching you give them. Okay? You can't teach but by two ways. That is by precept and example. Precept means that you teach it. Example means you live it. That's what, your, that's what your children need to see in you. You just can't send them to church and you live like the devil at home. Expect your children to be godly because they got you for an example. Why are you hearing me? Mama, if you got a boyfriend, you, you don't have too much strength to tell your daughter not to have one. Because they see the example that you said before her. Y'all don't want to talk to me too much today. Your life should be an example for your children because they got you to look at every day. When I send them to church, well, they don't be at church that long. It's 168 hours in a week, and they're at church about three hours a week. You need to show your children what God is like in your home. Fathers and mothers, your children don't need to, to hear you arguing and fussing. Yo. You need to take your disagreement in the other room. Y'all getting cold? All right, all right. 
for the highest priority for the believers to set a holy example for their children by the life they live. In doing so, they demonstrate a sincere love for them. You don't love your children exposing them to the devil. Quit telling them that you love them when their exposure by you is to the devil. You exposing them to the worst enemy of all flesh, and that's the devil himself. All right. Christian parents must likewise diligently do their best to keep their children from the ungodly influences of the world and to fail in this responsibility can bring eternal disasters. And I have a saying, and I, I mean this when I say it, I mean it with everything with them. You don't need no children. You don't need no children until you're ready to be a parent. You don't have to like me for saying that. There's too many children raising children. And there's too many got children don't even want them. Are y'all hearing me today? You need to be ready for marriage when you get married. Loose here, flesh. Many folks get married because they're burning. Come on here. Ain't ready for the responsibility. Just burn it in your flesh. That's why we have so many problems. It's too many that are in the role of parenthood and not being parents. Because you still want to ball yourself. You need to get all the balling out before you bring some children here. Y'all ain't saying too much. Y'all don't like me too much, but uh, all I'm doing is telling you what the Bible says. Am, am I off, Mother White? Am I off? I'm not off. Thank you. The mother said I'm not off. So don't y'all tell me that I'm off when the mother said I'm not. But I am reading. <laughs> hell. Let's talk about hell. We talked about offense. Now let's talk about hell. The place of unquenchable fire is so terrible that every influence of sin must be opposed and rejected. Whatever the cause is. You need to be careful what you expose your children to. You need to scrutinize what they watch on television. And I, I don't have nothing to do with it. Y'all Y'all grown. You, you spend your own money. It's hot up here, y'all. I don't know what I need to say this or not. Let me look the mother's way and see the shit I said. I don't know what I said shit or not. Y'all, y'all, y'all pray for Brother Turner. Y'all, y'all, I don't, I don't, I don't know everything. I know I'm old fashioned. I'm from the old school. I'm old fashioned and from the old school. But one thing, I'm pretty solid. Uh, y'all, y'all pray for me now. I'm finna, finna say something. Oh. <laughs> Ella Cobra, help pray for me now. Yeah. You, you need to be praying for me, brother. Cause I guess <laughs> I, I need to say this, and I, and, and, and I need to understand it too. I, I don't understand everything. I don't, I don't know. I don't know everything. I, I'm the first to tell. I don't know everything. But please tell me, what do your five-year-old child need with a telephone? Y'all pray for me now, girl. Your five-year-old daughter got a cell phone. Now, now, now hold it, hold it. Don't, don't stone me yet. I know y'all want to stone me. I already know that. You got every reason, girl. And you paying for it. I understand that. But here's my question. On a house phone, you can monitor. Hmm? See, I got, a, I got a house phone, got several, several, several plug in. You can plug your phone in, but it's the same number. 458, 2485. I don't care whether you're in the kitchen, in the bathroom, if you're on the house phone. I don't care if you're on top of the house. If you take the long car and go on top of the house, 
If you die 24, what are you thinking? <laughs> you can see I don't call it much. <laughs> 4, 5, 8, 24, 85, you're going to get my house phone. And if you pick up whatever extension you want to, I can pick up my, in my bedroom and hear your conversation. That means I can monitor my child. I don't care where he is. But can you monitor your child on a cell phone? I don't see, I don't see, I don't know that much. See, all this technology, you can take a cell phone and 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 and, and dial the well up, get a weather forecast, GPS, whole lot of stuff. So I don't know much. All I know by a cell phone is to make a phone call, receive a phone call, read a text. And my wife showed me the other day how to calculate. I've just learned how to calculate with my cell phone. That's all I know about cell phone. All this other stuff, these games, I don't, taking pictures. I, my cell phone would take pictures. I have never taken a picture with it. I got a camera to take pictures if I want to take a picture. In, in my day, you took pictures with cameras. I know y'all know all this new stuff. That's why I'm asking y'all, y'all help me. Can you monitor your child with a cell phone? Your 13-year-old daughter could be talking to a 40-year-old man right now. Get mad, but how do you know? You can't monitor them. And I think anything in your house that you can't monitor, you don't need it there. Especially when you got children. Y'all don't have to like me. My job is to enlighten you. Too many preachers trying to shout for you. can shout them all over the church. They still don't learn nothing. My job is to feed you with knowledge and understanding. If, you, if your child, you to, see, I know you get it because everybody else doing it. Are you going to let your child go to hell because everybody else's child going to hell? One daughter went to her mama and said, Mama, I wasn't supposed to preach long today. I told y'all I wasn't going to preach too long. But I did say I don't think. I did say that. She went to her mom and said, Mama, every girl. She, goes, she played on her mama's sympathy. That's why, mother, you got to be strong. Every girl, every Monday morning, got a whole lot to talk about what they did on the weekend and what they, who they were with on the weekend and all the excitement they had. I don't have nothing to talk about. You know, Mama said, well, you be one of those that don't have nothing to talk about. And way after a while, when all of these girls started getting pregnant and all of these, she came and said, Mama, I sure thank you. Yeah. But she was one of those that didn't have nothing to talk about on Monday morning. But church, you are not so dull because you love church. The church is a wonderful place. Jesus said, so upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus ain't said nothing about no cafe. He didn't say, what about a casino? Y'all ain't saying that. It said nothing about baseball and basketball and football either. Boxing and volleyball and tennis ball. He said nothing about none of that. He said, I build my church. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. So we got our own kingdom now. You know what it is? What I want to do. If I want to do, I'm going to try to find a scripture. To justify what I want to do. Listen, we must understand something. That there is a hell. And the fire in hell will never go out. Hell is not an accident. It's not a wrong turn. Oop. Whoop. I'm in hell. <laughs> I made a wrong turn. I'm up in hell. Well, if you made a wrong turn... And wind up in hell, I hate to tell you this, you will never get out. That's a turn you don't want to make. That is a road that leads to hell. And that's a road you don't need to be on. Because if you get there, I went to Ella Coleman, moved to Ella Coleman to the prison. Ella Coleman, I don't like going to that place up there. And you know what I don't like about it? They go through a door, they click them, they lock it behind you. That's nerve-wracking to me. 
Every time I go through a door, I hear them locking it behind me. Hell is worse than that. But one thing when I turn, one thing that was good about it though, when I we turn to come out, they open the door back up. There is no open door in hell. The door's locked and you're there and you can never get out. And sin will take you there. But deal with the worm in just a few minutes. The hands. I'm going to give you some scripture. We're not going to read them. I don't guess. Yes, we are. Colossians 3 and 5. Romans 8, 13. Ephesians 6 and 10. I'm going to just stop a few scriptures there. Colossians 3 and 5. Kind of like me. McKinney can. I feel like going on a little bit now. <laughs> you know McKinney, right? Al Banner, you sang Gay Bear. Yeah. You get to sing and you say, ah, I feel like going on a little bit now. So I feel like going on a little bit. Colossians 3 and 5 says, Modify therefore your members, which are born on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, in all affection, evil concupiscence that's complete out of control, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Get rid of this stuff. All of these material will cause you to lose your soul in hell. Romans 8, 13 says, if ye live after the flesh, that's Romans 8 and 13, if, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Ephesians 6 and 10 says this, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The hands and the feet and the eyes are set forth in the word of God as the instrument of the soul in comparison the gratification of certain distinctive evil lusts. The hand is the instrument of covetousness, grasping, and of violence. The feet are the means of evil companionship and running into ways of temptation and sin. They all hear me. Mm hmm. Through the eyes, the soul cover after that which is not her own. The eyes look at stuff that don't belong to you. And you want it. It's not bad to want some shoes like mine, but it's bad to want my shoes. Else, in a, in a hubby, if that wrong with you wanting a wife, just don't want my wife. That's all. <laughs> me no harm at all, y'all. This up here is horrible, y'all. That's what covered it is. Won't it? You're lusting after something that is not yours. Lusting after that which is forbidden and polluting. And through the eyes, the soul's envy and hate. We need to get rid of all this stuff. That's what I mean by cutting it off. Get rid of all of these things. Evil companionship. Cut it off. Well, I wouldn't do that by my husband. You let your husband take you to hell? Well, I, I wouldn't, but my wife, you, you gonna let her take your soul to hell? It ain't nobody worth you going to hell for. Are y'all listening to me today? Well, I, 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 I kind of, because that's the way my husband likes it. He likes for me to go out and show my cleavage. Loose here, devil. You got the devil in your house and you trying to please that devil. The Bible said the sanctified woman will sanctify the husband. You need to show him a standard. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Living in a way of lewdness, suggestiveness. It's a trick of the devil in the home. And you will never win him to Christ by lowering the standard. You know what Ella Jones said about her? This is what he told me. This is what he told the church many times. 
He said, this living epistle that I live with is what brought me in. The way she lived with all the stuff I did, the way she held up a standard. He said, that's what brought me in. Are y'all hearing me? You can't bring your husband in by looking like a whore. I hate to say that. I told y'all I need to say that. Can't bring him in doing that. You got to hold a standard. Holy Mother Dixon, you said this morning that holiness is a high standard. Pull this stuff down to y'all. Now, I get off on this. Through the eyes. You look at that stuff, you don't have no business looking at it. Ooh, ain't he cute that he got a wife? Where that worm dies not. I'm through. I'm going I'm to I'm deal with this, then I'm going to be through. Worm dies not. Let me show you something. Let's go to the, I always keep these scriptures confused. I know it's in Luke. It's either the 16th or the 12th chapter of Luke, where that man went to hell. Is it 12th? 16. I know the book of the electric Bible, he can find that stuff real quick. <laughs> he, get, he get that real Bible there. Okay, now I want to show you something here. Now, we're talking about worms never die. That was a rich man which was clothed in purpose and fair and fine linen and fair sumptuous every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of souls and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came, <coughs> excuse me, and licked his soul. Dog had more mercy on him than the rich man did. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angel to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Y'all, this is red writing. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and sees Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, what did he say? Have mercy. He didn't have mercy on Lazarus, but he, now he's in a place of needing mercy. Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And let Lazarus. And sent Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame where the worm never die. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to something here. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou, Son, what? Son, what? Son, what? That's what I want to point out to you. In hell, that's one thing you won't lose is your memory. The worms will never, you're going to remember every sermon you heard, everything you rejected, every opportunity you had to not to be here. You're going to remember that. Are y'all hearing me? That's what it meant by the worm would never die. There in hell, you will be able to reflect upon opportunity. Time of reflection. And I want to tell you, you will have a long time to reflect. Because hell is going to last as long as God lasts. And God ain't going to never die. I want to tell you all day, I'm just as serious as a heart attack when it come on you. A heart attack does not come into your life to bless you. It comes to take you out. I'm serious about this because I'm concerned about your soul being saved. And you will not be saved living your life in sin. 
in hell, you will remember every opportunity. Every time you played with God, you will remember. Long time to reflect. Folk told you, you got mad. You took it as a personal attack. You're going to remember all of that in hell. I'm almost through. All right. I got lost again. Here I am. Yeah. Uh huh. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good thing and likewise last for evil thing. But now he is comfort. And thou art. And thou art. And thou art. The torment won't stop. The fire won't never stop burning. The sun won't never go down. The wind won't never blow. No relief nowhere in sight. That's the way hell is. You can remember sitting here on the, on the 13th day. September 2015, when the opportunity came to you and you rejected it. But I've been going to church a long time. I was singing in the choir. I, I'm this. I, I'm a preacher. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed. You go to shame, send you to hell. You remember in hell that I was ashamed. Been in church too long to repent. You're going to remember all of this. That fire going to help you to remember. Gonna keep burning you, and you won't burn up. This hand, I was 1954. I was uh, Carver High School, Brownville, Tennessee. We were putting a roof. I was taking shop, taking shop. I was putting a roof on the house, and my job was to to we, we were melting hot pit. It came in hot chunks, and we would melt it, and then we would dip it out and pour it in a bucket. And they on the rooftop would pull it up and pull the hot pit to glue down the roofing. And I, my job was to melt the pit and to take that bucket and dip it out. And when I dipped it out, the band on that bucket broke. And that thing hit the ground and that hot pit hit this hand. I'm not too much on shouting. I shouted that day. My brother had just come out of the army. It was in 1955. He came out in February 55, early part 55. Because he had those thick army khakis. And I had on a pad of his khakis. That's the only way I didn't get burnt down because the pins were thick enough to keep that pit from going to my skin here. But it spill all over, but it hit his hand, took the skin off. And you can still see that was in 1955. That scar is still there now. But how long did it stay on me? Temporarily. Just a short while. It was miserable. Told me when I was two years old, I was rocking the rocking chair and fell over in the fireplace, burned this whole side of my face. Now, I was just two years old. I don't remember none of that. But my reaction to that e event afterward told everybody that I understood what happened. My cousin Nolan told me that after that, they couldn't get me close to a fire. What am I saying? Fire burn. It's tormented. This man is now tormented in a place that he can never get out. I'm trying to paint a picture of hell that everybody here that think you're going to hell will come to the altar. Don't have to know, just think I'm going there. I don't want you to go there. And I want you to know it's a terrible place to go. And I want you to know if you ever get there, you can't say, whoop, I'm in hell. Uh -uh. Ain't no whoops there. Whoop, I stuck my toe. You were up in hell, you ain't going to ever get out of that place. It's an eternal place. The worm won't ever die. The fire is unquenchable. That's what hell is like. Had a vision that one time. Went to hell in a vision once. <laughs> and God knows that's a place I have no intent of going. The most misery I ever seen in my life.
was in hell. Sister Rita Slaw in Muncie, the Lord allowed her to literally die and come back. She said, in that experience, she went to hell and was there with Jesus. And she talked about how many bishops she saw in hell. She said, I knew every one of them. I saw them there. She said, such misery, such woe. She said, and, the, and I, 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 was, I was constantly talking to Jesus about the condition he paid them no attention whatsoever. And this is what she, she said. She kept praying, these folks, and all he did to her was point at his blood. His blood was dripping. He pointed at his blood and said, they rejected my blood. There's nothing I can do for them. If you reject the plan of salvation, there is nothing else God can do for you. That's the plan. That's the highway. That's the road. That's the opportunity you have. Accept him now. Else you get in hell, it's going to be too late. Never get out. As long as God lives, you will live in hell. Hmm. Had a vision of heaven. The most beautiful place I've ever seen. So much peace and comfort. Flowers. Fruits. Everything. Wonderful. I don't care what you go through down here. One moment in heaven is worth it all. There's nothing you can enjoy in this life and then it's worth you enjoy and then take hell for your eternity. Hell is no place for you. Only you determine if you go there or not. Mama can't do it. Daddy can't do it. The preacher can't do it. You make that determination as to where you spend eternity. The worm will never die. Memory. Y'all listen to me. Let's, let, let's look at this man one more time. Ah. Abraham says, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good thing, and likewise Lazarus, evil thing, but now he is comfort, and thou art atonement. And beside all of this, between us and you, there was a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that will come to them, from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, this man is in hell, y'all. Since there's no hope for me, since I can't get out, 20, verse 27, then I, I pray thee, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. This is in the Bible, y'all. It's been there all the time. It ain't nothing new. This story is just as old as the word of God. And most of us don't forgot is there. We act like it. Mm -hmm. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. I don't want my brothers to come here. Let Lazarus go back. He said, no, they got Moses. Y'all don't like Brother Turner, but you got me. I know y'all wish I would preach how wonderful heaven is. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to preach that too. But I need to tell you what you need to do to get there. Uh -huh. I got five brothers. Matthew's because he had five brothers. Woo. <sighs> He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophet, neither would they, would they persuade the one rose from the dead. The day you hear his voice, don't you harden your heart. A bitter reflection. I might have avoided sin, but I did not. I might have been saved, but I would not. Must be equal to 10,000 tormentors. What intolerable English must this produce in a soul that is damned to hell. It seems everyone has his worm, his particular remorse for the evil he did. 
and for the grace he rejected. While the state of excruciating torment is common to everybody that's in hell, that's one place you're going to have a plenty of company. Everybody in hell is going to be tormented. Nobody going to be comfortable there. But you have an opportunity today while life is going on to make all the necessary correction that needed to be made. It's up to you. Nobody can do it for you but you. Hell awaits all unbelievers. The devil and all of his angels. Hell is filled with proud folks. Lustful folks. Filled with them. Folks that don't have time for the regular folks. It's full of those folks. Everybody in hell is in torment today. And everybody that shall go to hell tomorrow will be in torment. It's a place of torment. There ain't nothing in this life worth you losing your soul over. That's a part of you that will never die. Your body, you, you try to stick this body up and make it look all the thing or like that long. Every time I look in the face, I see wrinkles. I be looking in the mirror, you know. Mm, it's a new one here, you know. <laughs> this old body fading. And I like to talk about the body like we talk about automobile. Put the bird in, the body fades just like parts on a car. Mother Blade had a stroke at the age of, what, 86. She is being restored, but she's 86. 86 years of wear and tear. My heart is not as strong today as it was 40 years ago. And I have sense enough to know that. Are y'all hearing me? I allow age to come upon me gracefully. I don't try to act like a teenager. I'm not a teenager. I had my teenage and I enjoyed it. You ain't saying nothing. I've been 16, 26, 36, 46, 56, 66, and 76, and still kicking. You ain't saying nothing. I kicked through all of the sixes. But the 76 done slowed me. Ah, are y'all talking? LSU am not making any sense at all. Your body wears down and quit trying to act like a teenager when you are 55. You are 40 years behind. Come on here. Try to jump around like a teenager, you're 55 years old. Go through and break something, it's gonna take five years for the cool. Come over here. Yeah, mother, mother, mother's being restored, but keep in mind, 86 years of wear and tear. That means her men will be slow. Because the older you get, the longer it takes you to heal. Common sense ought to tell you that. Hmm? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I know y'all, I'm talking about you, brother. I know y'all, I know y'all don't, y'all, y'all don't have this problem. It's just me. Sometimes just be walking through, I hear a bone pop, pop, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I, I know I'm the only one. Y'all, y'all don't have that problem. I know y'all know. I'm the only one. That, so that, that walk ain't nothing because that pop. I hear oh, Jesus. <laughs> Time <laughs> working on me. Wearing down, wearing out. One man, I'm closing. One man, doctor was examining him. Just examining, putting that. What you call that thing? Yeah, y'all say it. I just put it on. He put it on. He said, uh, "What? He said, Doc, what's wrong with me?" He said, "Nothing. Just wore out." <laughs> Ninety years old, you wore out. That's what's wrong. <laughs> just face it. We wear out. But let's wear out gracefully. There's a place for old folks. The old is for counsel. You want to know something? Come to us old folks. You want somebody to run and jump? Find some young folks. 
Are you hearing me? I believe as old people we should exercise, try to make this body last as long as we can and do all we can to stay healthy, change our diets and eat right, and eat with some common sense and don't let your taste bug put you in the way. Dr. Bishop Miller, Bishop Williams said, if it tastes good, spit it out because it ain't good for you. <laughs> Most health food ain't good. For, doesn't taste good, but it's good for you. We love stuff tastes good. And uh, after a while, they be saying, Nero, my God. Dude. Way before your time. Why you ate yourself out of this life by not using good judgment? Come on, tell him thank you. Come on, tell him thank you. I know I was, I'm, I'm closing. I, tell, I, I told the church all night, I, I I tell stuff I shouldn't tell because I'm a preacher. Preacher tell everything. We are, we are tellers. And I, I'm getting to the place now. I've been eating fast all of my life. Sister Savior came to me, I eat like a jackrabbit. I eat fast. I just, I'm a fast eater. Now, starting this year. A couple of months ago, <laughs> I had to start slowing down. The food don't go down quite as fast as it used to. Mm-hmm. And the first, first few times it happened, I stopped. Right in the middle of the meal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for Lady D. She, I mean, she, she observed everything. If I move this way, she see it. She was thinking, she looked and said, what's wrong? I didn't want to say that I'm <laughs> There, I, go. I said, the food is not moving quite like it's supposed to. She said, yeah, that's what slow down is. That's what you <laughs> she, she been telling me that for six years, slow down. I think I'm beginning to hear her a little bit. Brother Mark, when I take my time now and masticate the food real good, that's what these teeth for. Just grind it up real good and Slowly swallow it, it keep rolling. Old age is teaching me that. You have to learn how to be old. Been young all your life, y'all gotta learn how to be old. And if you let this old person tell you, I tell you how to be old. Slow down. Slow down. Take your time. It'll be there when you get there. And I come when you want it. <laughs> It'll be old time. <laughs> Last night I'm closing. <laughs> the uh, alarm company called by 12 o'clock last night because the alarm wasn't set. And I thought it was on. I didn't really well. I thought somebody else had set it, but they didn't set it. So they called me to let me know it wasn't on. So I got up, put on some clothes. I was in the bed. Come on here. And I put on my cap, trousers, and my coat. Came over. I went back home. I said, said everything. Went back home, got in the bed. <laughs> I'm laying there. Lady, lady D said, you can pull your cap off now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I had it on. <laughs> in the bed with my cap on. <laughs> she said, you, you can put it off now. All right. I don't get mad. I said, okay. <laughs> Learn how. Learn how to let folks help you. Whether uh, I'm, I'm almost through with this. Everything you rejected, all that you rejected, I, my desire, the Lord laid this on my heart and I couldn't get away from it. My desire, and I know, Mother Dixon, what you brought, Sister, Ma, Sister Martha, what you shared and what he had given me. God don't want nobody to be lost. You who come to this church here, I'm not boasting this church, I'm just saying truth. You who come here, you don't have no excuse. So we tell you the truth over here, am I right? If Ellen Shield girl, he's going to tell you the truth. Brother Pete, going to tell you, Ellen Colby, we're all going to tell you. It doesn't matter if Mother White, if Charlie, I don't care. Who get up, we're going to tell you the truth. We're not going to sugarcoat nothing to you. So if you go all, you own your own. You're traveling at your own risk. Because there's one thing we are committed to in this church. 
We're committed to everybody's standard. Committed to the truth. Now, not going to make no big end roll over nothing. I preach what the Lord gave me. Sin sends one to hell. Now, I can make a a huge magnified altar call. I could do that. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to simply say this. You know you're in sin and you want to be saved. The opportunity is yours to come now. If you know that you're in sin and you want to be saved, the opportunity is yours to come now. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I'm a, Brother Keith said something today. Thank you for coming. Maybe somebody else. Brother Keith said something today. He said that Jesus is on his way back here. But he said something. He said that, but he may not be coming back after the masses. He just may be coming back for you. And that is your judgment day. The day he comes back for you, that's your, that's your last opportunity. There is no other hope for you. If he comes for you today, you say, well, I'm just going to put this all. For, for what and for when? How do you know that you have another chance? One Wednesday night, a pastor and eight members went to church, not knowing that a demonic man would come in and take each of their lives. Most of them, no doubt, were healthy folks. They didn't go to church to get killed. They went there for Bible study. But the enemy came and took their life. The devil is not your friend. He's after your soul. You see, your life, if all, if all he could get would be your life, you're going to have to die anyway. But if he gets your soul, your soul is the only part of you that is eternal. Your body won't last too long. 60, 70, 80, 90, maybe a few 100 years. You'll miss it. But the soul would last as long as God lives. And that's what you need to make sure that your soul is in a right relationship with God.